Good morning, everyone, and thank you for attending the 2020 Welcome Day for the newest class of IMT School PhD students. This year, the event takes some particular importance, as today is the 15th anniversary of the IMT School's founding. We are very pleased to virtually celebrate this important anniversary together. For the welcome remarks, we are now going to stream a message by the president of the Luca Foundation for Higher Education and Research, Marcello Bertocchini. Buongiorno, buongiorno a tutti. È per me un vero piacere, in qualità di presidente della Fondazione Lucchese per l'alta formazione e la ricerca, poter rivolgere un saluto ai nuovi studenti della scuola IMT. In questi giorni è facile cadere nella retorica, ma non possiamo sorvolare sulla singolarità del momento che stiamo vivendo e di conseguenza rafforzare come questa giornata sia particolarmente importante e significativa. È infatti l'occasione di un benvenuto, quindi di un nuovo inizio. Un nuovo inizio è quello che tutti stiamo attendendo da mesi e che purtroppo appare ancora lontano in queste ore in maniera particolare. Ma anche nel momento più difficile è necessario pensare al futuro. Non solo aspettare passivamente tempi migliori, ma costruire il domani mattone sopra mattone. La ricerca, l'istruzione e la formazione rappresentano in questo momento di certo il miglior investimento in una prospettiva di crescita, di progresso e di ripartenza. La scuola IMT è ormai da anni istituzione di riferimento nel panorama nazionale e internazionale. Una scuola che ha saputo evolvere senza mai fermarsi ai risultati ottenuti, che da tempo la vedono ai vertici per qualità della ricerca e capacità di innovazione. IMT nasce sulla base di un principio di multidisciplinarità, di continuo match e confronto tra settori delle scienze matematiche, umanistiche e sociali. La sua strada non può che essere questa, improntata all'innovazione e al rapporto con nuove discipline, Un'eredità recente che i docenti si impegnano a perpetuare, ma che di fatto coinvolge direttamente anche voi, ragazze e, e ragazzi, qui per intraprendere un percorso di crescita personale che si riverbera positivamente anche sulla collettività. I vostri progressi, il vostro cammino, sono i progressi della comunità scientifica, quindi occasione di benessere e sviluppo per tutta la società. I risultati che i dottorandi della scuola ottengono a Lucca e poi nel mondo testimoniano l'assoluta validità di questo progetto formativo e di ricerca del quale Fondazione Lucchese per l'alta formazione della ricerca crede senza alcuna riserva. Permettetemi anche di sottolineare come la Fondazione Cassa di Risparmio di Lucca, che ho attualmente l'onore di presiedere, sin dall'inizio abbia creduto nelle possibilità di questa realtà che porta il mondo a Lucca e Lucca nel mondo. Nelle prospettive e nelle programmazioni della Fondazione Cassa di Risparmio di Lucca, IMT è infatti strategica, elemento catalizzatore di risorse, di idee e di innovazione anche per Lucca e per i suoi territori. Ecco perché manteniamo vivo il nostro impegno ad ampliare il campus, obiettivo che ci auguriamo sia prossimo a vedere la luce. E quindi con l'augurio di intraprendere il vostro percorso nella maniera migliore che vi rivolgo questo saluto, augurandovi anche di realizzare i vostri sogni, affrontando le sfide con entusiasmo, gioia e passione. We are now going to stream a welcome message by the Mayor of Luca, Alessandro Tambellini. Inizia un nuovo anno accademico per gli MT. L'IMT significa istituzioni, mercati e tecnologie e comunque questa scuola di alta formazione ha saputo poi allargare la sua visione culturale anche ad altri ambiti e questo è stato sicuramente un motivo di arricchimento. L'IMT rappresenta oggi una delle istituzioni di cui la città va più orgogliosa, fa parte della nostra storia recente. Quando si parla di formazione culturale, quando si parla di ricerca, quando si parla di alta visione delle prospettive che ci attengono, eh, 
si, si deve anche tuttavia capire che la ricerca va sostenuta, la formazione culturale deve essere la base del nostro vivere insieme e la ricerca si sostiene soltanto con politiche adatte e giuste per lo sforzo della ricerca che può portarci ad ambiti nuovi, che può portarci a inserirci in modo valido nelle novità che il mondo annualmente ci propone annualmente forse è anche una prospettiva troppo grande giornalmente ci propone e lo vediamo ora con il tempo che stiamo vivendo con un'epidemia che qualche mese fa era addirittura del tutto impensabile ebbene voi giovani voi persone che vi accostate ora alla vost al vostro momento formativo più ampio dovete compiere questo sforzo potente e spero che nella città troviate il sostegno e troviate l'ambiente utile per la vostra grande, bella formazione. Luca, spero vi sia accanto, vi sia vicina in questa vostra attività complessa, forse difficile, anche faticosa, ma spero che qui troviate anche quel conforto, quel momento di bellezza, quel momento di distrazione che eh, crea l'equilibrio di una vita. Il sapere, la conoscenza, lo studio sono una grande cosa. A me sono serviti molto nella mia esistenza per la concezione, per avere una concezione diversa dell'esistenza stessa. Mi auguro che voi troviate qui da noi, nella nostra città, quel percorso giusto che possa poi realizzare le vostre speranze, i vostri desideri, il vostro futuro. We now invite the director of IMT School, Professor Pietro Petrini, to give his address. Good morning to everyone and welcome to the IMT School for Advanced Studies. It's sort of a strange ceremony today. Actually, as a matter of fact, it's not even a ceremony in the meaning of the word because uh, you all are uh, uh, connected uh, from your room, from your place. My colleagues and friends are, co are connected from uh, their offices or their uh, uh, houses. Uh, only a very few people are here in the Cappella Guinigi, our historical uh, meeting room which in uh, the past years, this very same day, used to be filled with uh, students, professors, researchers, administrative people, all together to celebrate <clears throat> the welcome of the new students admitted to the school. In spite of this uh, physical uh, distancing, which is not really a social distancing, is a physical distancing, because socially we are uh, still connected and probably even more so than we used to be. And this is a, this ceremony, this uh, online ceremony is uh, a, an indication of this. Because this physical distancing cannot prevent us from, um, and the restriction of the COVID, the, the, precaution measures for the COVID pandemic cannot prevent us from giving you all our best welcome to the school. And so, welcome to all our new PhD students. Uh, you were selected out from uh, 80, 849 applications with a very high ratio between the number of applications and the admitted uh, candidates. Applications uh, were lower than in the previous years, but still a very uh, huge number if you consider the pandemic, the restriction that uh, are affecting and uh, have been affecting for uh, several months and still will for many months to go our daily life worldwide. We received, uh, despite this, we received application from 85 different countries 173 students were then invited for interview, and so 
you now follow into the steps the footsteps of uh, the 340 students that to date have uh, earned their PhD at the school before you. And here you can see the, uh, what I was saying before, the different distribution, geographic distribution of the application uh, across the world. And this uh, slide itself underlines an important feature of a school. There are no geographical boundaries in the school, Actually, there are no boundaries at all of any kind. What is the school? The school, you see here, and that's why the welcome day is today, November 18. 15 years ago, November 18, 2005, there was the decree that established the IMT school and let me read the words of a decree. The IMT school institutions, markets, technologies for advanced studies, Luca, has been founded with effect from the 2005-2006 academic year as a superior graduate school with the status of a doctoral college was statute annexed to the present decree is approved. IMT school promotes the full integration of research and education through the constitution of a limited number of multidisciplinary research areas, which provide the reference point for recruitment of IMT school faculty and researchers. We implemented and developed, uh, my colleagues and myself over these years, the, uh, what is written in uh, the decree. And the school provides a stimulating environment for cutting edge multidisciplinary research, offers multidisciplinary PhD programs and postdoctoral training activities with a special focus on the economic, institutional, social, and technological spheres. What is the IMT school? The IMT school is one of the six schools with a special status within the Italian university system. What uh, it means exactly to be a special status school in Italy? We need a small, relatively small, research-oriented, PhD-focused, non-generalist school. We have a government funding mechanism, so we are a public institution funded by the Italian government, and we are based basically on quality competition. So we belong to this uh, uh, network and I use the word network because we are creating a real network with the other schools that you see here, the Scuola Normale Superiore in Pisa, Scuola Sant'Anna in Pisa, SIS in Trieste, US in Pavia, and Gran Sasso Science Institute, which is the most recent one in uh, L'Aquila. And as you can see, three out of the six schools are in Tuscany and actually are uh, within 25 kilometers. So Pisa Lucca uh, possess three of the uh, six uh, special status scores. And this gives our region a, actually a, a strong commitment to foster research and high, uh, higher education. Briefly, how are we organized? The school governance, there is director. I have been director since November 2015. My mandate will be over in 2021, in uh, October 31st. Uh, there is, a, a, by statute, a, a deputy director, which now is Professor Ennio Bilancini, an economist. There are then delegates, which I will show you in a few seconds. And uh, uh, there is a board of governors and an academic senate, which are the organs of the school. Delegates, uh, there is also, of course, uh, an administrative director, who will bring uh, his, um, his greetings uh, in uh, this morning later on. And uh, the newly appointed administrative director is Dr. Giulio Bolzonetti, who comes from University of Camerino. The delegates are uh, uh, the professor you see here, and uh, each one of, him, of them uh, is, uh, uh, as a a, 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 has a mandate for a specific topic, uh, going from uh, didactic activities and higher education, research, internationalization, uh, the relation with alumni and social policies and equal opportunities and delegates for innovation and relation with institutions and territories. 
At the moment, we are a, a relatively small school. As a matter of fact, uh, we are the smallest school among the uh, six schools that I just mentioned. We have uh, 19 professors on board, 10 full professors, nine associate professors. We have eight tenure track associate professors uh, who are currently in the assistant professor position, so called RTDB. Uh, we have 25 fixed terms researchers between a postdoc and assistant professor, 41 uh, persons in the administrative staff, 163 PhD students, and um, in terms of, uh, of, of budget, uh, we receive around 8 million funding from the government, which is called the FFO, the funding, uh, uh, financing funding for university and about 1 million funding from other sources, and this latter number, of course, is variable depending on how much money you're able to attract every year. This is just an average. Uh, these are our professors. You will uh, hopefully become familiar with their faces over the next uh, few months, hopefully because uh, if we keep having this situation of, um, of uh, distancing and of... Uh, uh, limitations in being present uh, uh, physically at the school. There will be fewer opportunities to meet and to chat and to, uh, uh, to eat together with, uh, between professors and, uh, uh, and students and researchers. Uh, lessons will be mostly by remote, uh, so you will become familiar with the faces uh, through the, the screen, through the web, right, uh, we are doing right now. Uh, and uh, hopefully in uh, when this pandemic will be under better control, will be resume uh, the ordinary or almost ordinary. The foundation was instrumental, crucial, fundamental in the birth of a school 15 years ago, in the process that preceded the birth of a school. There is no board without this gestation, and it was a long process. And the school is still instrumental for the everyday life and for the development of a school. The campus where you are hosted where you have your uh, rooms, where we have our uh, teaching room, the canteen, this uh, wonderful Cappella Guinigi belongs to Fondazione Casa di Risparmio di Lucca, and the school received from the Fondazione a, a comodato d'uso, which translated means a free of charge contract for the utilization of this building. Uh, for uh, many, many years, for 25 years, uh, and uh, renewable, hopefully. Uh, you will uh, become familiar with the campus, the, um, the main campus.
start the current situation will not slow down the process too much we are in the uh, we are basically going to start um, the, uh, the enlargement of the campus. So what are our um, points of uh, strength? The multidisciplinary model, the high quality scientific profile of uh, our researchers and scientists, the high profile and the particular profile of our PhD programs, which will be um, described to you by our uh, uh, colleagues uh, uh, who are the coordinators of the programs, Professoressa Maria Luisa Catoni and Professor Rocco De Nicola, who will talk uh, in a few moments, and uh, the model of a residential campus. Uh, the campus uh, is uh, very important because a campus meaning, means living together, means living uh, 24 hours a day in the campus for your, for your students, eating together, having an opportunity to interact uh, among uh, yourselves, with researchers, with postdocs, with professors, and to live the true experience of what it means to be part of a community in a special school. Uh, attending a special school is uh, something that will, leave, will, will remain for you for the rest of your life and will be something that you will always think back to the days when uh, you were at the school, to the period of your life you spent here. Uh, you will form uh, bounds, uh, friendships, will, uh, which will last forever and which will always have a peculiar uh, flavor, a particular flavor, the flavor of the friendship and the bounds which have been formed within the school. We are... Uh, pursuing a strategic objective to grow, to grow with, uh, <clears throat> with our educational activities. We are uh, thinking now how, to, we can, how, how we can uh, um, improve even more our doctoral courses. Uh, we will be seasonal schools. We have uh, just, as you know, brought the length of a research doctorate to four years. So your doctorate will last for four years. We have a, a series of measures to foster and to sustain, uh, to sustain PhD candidates, PhD students uh, after they, uh, they have uh, uh, obtained their degree. And we, we will go into details this later on. We are expanding our research activities by funding a strongly position for junior faculty, for postdocs. There is an important relationship with the nearby territory. You have already understood by the words that you heard by uh, Marcello Bertocchini, the president of uh, FLAFRE and uh, Fondazione Casa di Risparmio di Lucca, that you heard from uh, the major Alessandro Tambellini, how important and how strong is the relationship that the school has, has developed, has an intent to develop further with the territory, with the institution of a territory, with the industries, the companies, the museums, uh, all, of, all the other uh, uh, all, all the other institutions and players of the territory. Another important uh, aspect is the coordination with the other uh, other schools with special statue. As I said, we are six, six schools with special status in Italy. We need to have a, a stronger coordination to form a true network for higher formation in Italy. This will give us more power in the Italian context, will give us more structured uh, organization, and will also increase our uh, weight in, in the international context. The school is organized with research units. I'm not going into details. You see here a list. And uh, PhD programs, which will be uh, exhaustively uh, presented by my colleagues later on. Uh, so I'm going to skip this. We have some uh, in-house laboratories, which have grown uh, through the years uh, for uh, doing studies uh, in, for specific disciplines and also with a multidisciplinary and shared approach. 
Financing of a school, as I mentioned before, comes from the Italian Ministry of Education, University and Research, uh, which actually now is only Ministry of University and Research, and the Luca Foundation for Higher Education and Research, FLAF, through, uh, I would say, mostly through the Fondazione Casa di Risparmio di Luca, and I've already described how this uh, works. We are uh, organized with uh, in-house uh, doctorate courses, which are those for which, for which you applied and won a position. But also we are doing uh, uh, other things in collaboration with other institutions. And in particular, uh, I'd like to uh, mention here the joint PhD in data science, which is going to become uh, a joint PhD in artificial intelligence. Uh, which is uh, conjointly uh, developed with uh, the other two special schools in Pisa, the University of Pisa and the CNR, the National Research Council in Pisa. And this shows actually how if you form a bond, if you form a network, you can offer students, motivated students from uh, all over the planet, uh, novel and uh, original, innovative uh, um, uh, schools, innovative uh, uh, research doctorates to, to attend. Um, we are uh, connected with uh, several other institutions in, uh, in the world and our, uh, one of our goals for the next uh, uh, period is to improve and to extend this collaboration because it's important to have uh, uh, people coming from different places to spend time in Lucca and to have people from Lucca, our students and researchers go abroad and share experiences with other places. Um, Marcello Bertocchini used an expression which I like very much and I used myself before, uh, Lucca nel mondo, il mondo, il mondo a Lucca, uh, which means to bring people from uh, all over the places to Lucca and to bring Lucca all over the places in the world. And this is actually what we pursue with our mission. So, uh, the school usually have, has uh, uh, three main uh, days, uh, three main occasions to stay together uh, within the school. One is uh, today, the Welcome Day. Uh, we celebrate the Welcome Day on November 18th because, as I said before, is our Foundation Day. And this symbolizes how much importance we put on the formation of uh, young, motivated students from all over the world. We are a school. We exist because of you, because of uh, we have students. Otherwise, we wouldn't be a school. We would be a research institution, very good research institute, like many others in our country and elsewhere in the world, but we wouldn't be what we are. We are a school where uh, formation and research go hand to hand, where uh, our uh, scientists, our professors, our researchers are uh, top quality scientists and transmit their knowledge and their um, way of thinking to, to younger motivated students. So Welcome Day is by no chance, I mean, it's not uh, by chance that is on November 18, it's because this is the most important day of a school. It's like your birthday. I mean, you celebrate your birthday because that day you were born. We celebrate November 18, the welcoming of uh, the new students because on that day we were born and without students, we wouldn't be born or at least we would not be born where we, we are. We also have uh, Academic year, academic year inaugurational ceremony, which uh, this year could not take place because of uh, the pandemic. We will see if we in the next, over the next few months we can do something about this. And then another important moment is graduation ceremony later on in the year, be just before the summer break, where students uh, who graduated receive their diploma. The latest innovations for the uh, PhD program are what I already mentioned, the uh, extension to four-year program, four minus one-year program, with an innov innovative formula which uh, allow you to obtain your diploma already at the end of the third year, if you wish so, if you have completed your research program, if you have a job offer, if you 
decide that that is what is going to be better for you or to stay four years in your PhD program so that you can dedicate more time, devote more time to your research program. Why is this um, the formula we, our colleagues, my colleagues and myself decided to, to embrace? Because PhD is not only the first step for academic career, is a, almost a mandatory, would say, first step for academic career, but it's not only that, it's much more. A PhD is a, an instrument, is a way to improve your critical skills, to become better scientists, better professionals, better rational individuals. And this applies to every aspect of our life, to any profession. So is a PhD as a, in the way at least we intend it, as a much wider and deeper and general utility than uh, the strict academic uh, pursuit, the pursuit of an academic career. So the flexibility between four and three years uh, basically combines both the needs of people who wish to pursue an academic career and who embrace challenging uh, research projects who require a lot of time and people who are uh, more devoted to a professional career in a bank, in a in company, in a public institution, in a governmental institution, uh, in, uh, in a museum or whatever. And uh, we may think that uh, uh, we are ready after three years also because many of your colleagues receive a job offer already when they are uh, at the, you know, the second and half year of course. So, of course, this is an opportunity to take. We have um, the Frontier Proposal Fellowship Program, uh, which allowed and is allowing your colleagues uh, who still are in the three-year course program to have an extra year for projects who are particularly demanding. And it's this is As researchers, as students, as human beings, I would say, 
we need to think of those individuals who are not as lucky as we are. Lucky meaning that we were born in the right place, in the right moment, or at least we were not born in the wrong place, in the wrong moment. We are here, we are able to pursue our research ideas, to grow as a scientist. We have the, as much freedom as you may imagine, or even all beyond that, beyond imagination, to do research. Actually, you are encouraged, we are encouraged also to discuss and to have uh, an open view. So we have what uh, we take uh, for granted, uh, freedom. We have, uh, freedom is uh, so important, it's so taken for granted for us, which is like air. And actually, the pandemic uh, brought our, uh, under attention how important uh, it is to have freedom. Now that even in uh, free countries, like our country, we are subjected to restriction. You cannot go out of your region, you cannot go out. You have lockdown, you couldn't go out of your own house. You were uh, subjected to control if you came to work. And I had uh, every, almost every morning to justify why I was coming here from my, my home. Well, that was a, a very good experience to appreciate what freedom means. Freedom is like air. You don't uh, mind air, you don't think of air until you cannot breathe anymore. And then you think how important is air and how much you miss air and how vital is air and this is freedom. So there are uh, individuals in many places in this, can in this uh, planet who cannot enjoy the freedom of thinking or freedom at all. And so we, we are very glad to have entered the Scholars at Risk. Scholars at Risk is a network, is an important network which collects and uh, gain to, gathers together uh, many universities, universities around the world, over 450 universities, over 45 in Italy. And uh, this network tries to provide support, hospitality, a free environment for research, a supportive environment for research to all those people at different degrees of a career in their life who cannot, who don't have this freedom in their country because of reasons that are independently from their behavior and their will. And this is something that the school is very proud to belong to and, uh, uh, and, to, and to foster. I would go at this point uh, to uh, skip all this. We have several uh, activities in the so-called third mission. Third missions, uh, semantically speaking, uh, means uh, the mission that comes after uh, research and formation. As a matter of fact, it's not a third mission. It's a, a mission which combines together research and formation and goes beyond the walls of a school, meaning talking to the territories, to the institution, to lay people. There is no research that cannot be communicated to anybody else. When you have a research project, you think that that research project is too complicated, the results are too specific that you cannot explain those results to your uh, gra great grandmother, as we say in Italy, uh, that means that uh, you yourself do not have a clear idea of what you are doing. There is no research that cannot be explained. What implication cannot be communicated to anybody else. And this is crucial because communicating research means to fight ignorance and fighting ignorance means to spread knowledge, and sp spreading knowledge means to give people the critical basis to think, the knowledge and the instruments to think with their own mind. And this is the best way to fight prejudice, to fight fake news, to fight uh, behaviors that are not sound, that are not scientifically, rationally sound. This is our mission. Our mission is not only to do research, but to bring 
that research, to bring results of research, to bring implication of research to as many people as we can. There are not only scientific publications, there are scientific publication and publication which are scientifically ground but readable by everyone. We have uh, many opportunities, we have developed many opportunities, I'm very thankful to all my colleagues who have taught of those, who have developed those. We will have one in a very few days, bright, the night of researchers, and I invite all of you to follow this edition, which will be online, but not for this will be less, less relevant. And as I said, this is a very important thing uh, that uh, the school is pursuing actively. I'm going to conclude because I don't want to take too much time and I think I already did. Uh, I think that just by this brief presentation and uh, even more so by the presentation that my colleagues will uh, deliver in a, in a few moments with the specific of all the courses and what we do here, you at the end of this morning will uh, get an idea that uh, the MT school is a small universe. We are a small school. Actually, the smallest school. We are growing. We must grow. But we are in a small school. But yeah, IMT is a, a universe of knowledge. It's a place where uh, you have the opportunity to stay with other people, to communicate with other people. And the universe is actually a good metaphor, maybe a little bit ambitious, but a good metaphor. Because you know that... Um, Gravity is not something that exists per se. Gravity is something that exists because there are the planets. So without the planets, there would be no gravity in the universe. And this was actually the big intuition, one of the big intuitions of Einstein. And uh, the school is the same thing, because uh, the school wouldn't be a school without you, without our researchers, without our professor, without, let me say, our uh, technical and administrative personnel which is the backbone of the activities of, at the school. And as a universe, we are uh, constantly growing. We are constantly growing to expand our, our boundaries. I told you before that we have no boundaries. Actually, we do have one boundary. This is the only boundary that we mind. And I will tell you in a few seconds. Because we are human beings, and uh, as human beings, we have always wondered, since the very early philosophers, what uh, distinguishes us from uh, animals. And if you read uh, ancient philosophers, Greek, Platone, Aristotle, Plato, Aristotle, you find very nice uh, uh, disquisition on what makes us humans. I will uh, strictly stay in, in the neuroscience field, and uh, you know that we have a different brain from those of uh, even uh, uh, of non-human uh, pri non primates, animals which are close to us in evolutionary, in evolutionary terms. You see here the brain of a monkey ward, the chimpanzee almost looks like a human brain, but the human brain is certainly more complicated, is certainly more developed. And uh, so what makes us different from uh, other animals? Uh, there is a, in a experimental psychology, a, a long discussion about this. They say, you know, we can use instruments. Well. Animals can use instruments. You see here a monkey taking food with a spoon, basically from a long uh, bottle, uh, with a bottle with a long neck. This other monkey is basically crushing the nuts with a stone, like we do when you know uh, we are uh, we want to eat some nuts and we are outside. Uh, we say, well, we use language to communicate. It's true, we use language, but we are not the only one. Chimpanzee can learn even human language or to communicate with the sign language, more than human sign language. Of course, we do this to a much better level, to a more sophisticated level, but uh, no, it's not a categorical difference. There is only one categorical difference. What really makes us different from the animal world is to imagine the future. Imagine the future means that we can think of ourselves in conscious terms here and now and think of what we want to be or where we would be. This is... Uh, a medal which comes with the reverse of the face of a medal. Of course, this means also that we are conscious of our affinity, of a way that one day all of us, none of us, will be on this planet any longer. But this also enables us to think of a time we are on this planet in the best possible way. 
to imagine our future, to contribute to design our future. We need to ask why always in front of everything and doubt what we know already. We need to be able to use this instrument to plan our future. If at the end of a research course that you are starting today, you will uh, leave a school with a better ability to be critical, to not take for granted uh, what you hear, what you see, what people tell you, but to be able to judge that, to ask uh, whether or not that could be just the opposite way, to challenge what uh, is taken for uh, common knowledge, and to use your uh, intelligence and your knowledge to push forward that only boundary that we know, the boundary which separates ignorance from knowledge, trying to push the boundary like a universe, keep going, growing and have a, a larger, wider universe of knowledge, well, we will be happy, we will have done our job. So welcome to the 36th cycle of a doctorate to the IMT school. Uh, enjoy every moment of your life at the school, every moment of your life in Lucca, simply every moment of your life. Best of luck. The ceremony proceeds with the presentation of the PhD programs. We now invite Professor Emanuele Pellegrini to present the curriculum in analysis and management of cultural heritage, which is under the Cognitive and Cultural Systems PhD program. Welcome everybody in Luca. I really hope to, uh, to meet you in person in Luca. So let's start with our presentation. I am, my name is Emanuele Pellegrini. I am the track director of the analysis of the track of analysis and management of cultural heritage. We can start our presentation. I'm going to show you in a few slides our PhD track. The first slide uh, is about the uh, our program. Uh, our program is uh, in analysis and management of cultural heritage. It was founded by Professor Sacatoni in 2010, and we have one research unit which is associated to our track, which is LINCS, the Center for the Interdisciplinary Analysis of Images. And Professor Sacatoni is the director of the uh, unit. The next slide uh, uh, is about the the core, the structure of our track. The cultural heritage is at the very center, the heart of our program. There are around cultural heritage, there are different academic fields which are tools to understand cultural heritage and to solve problems related to cultural heritage. So uh, and when I, with the word different academic field, I mean, uh, uh, research fields from different, from hard science and humanities. So archaeology, art history, philosophy, and history, which are usually associated with cultural heritage, but also management, analysis of complex projects and system, uh, data analysis and visualization, and also technological tools applied to the analysis of cultural heritage. Next slide. Um, and this uh, structure is mirrored by the background of our students. Our students, uh, as usually has, and those here, always has uh, different backgrounds. They are uh, art historians, archaeologists, historians, but also philosophers, uh, arch architects, uh, people that have studied economy and management or computer science, because our aim is to deal with the cultural heritage and to tackle with the problem of cultural heritage from different perspectives. The next slide is uh, I'm going to show you uh, just an overview of the main trend of our application. Uh, these are the submitted application of our cycles. As you can see, there is a sort of a, of a balance between foreign students and Italian students. Uh, there is mm, probably a little bit more from foreign students. And because, of course, one of the, uh, the major issue of our track is that it's uh, uh, located in Italy, and Italy offers a lot of opportunity uh, to study and to have a deep knowledge of the problem related to cultural heritage. The next slide is uh, about the structure of our 
uh, track in, in terms of organization of the fourth year. For the first year, uh, students have to attend classes which are mandatory and are very important for our program, just because there are uh, different kind of academic fields. So students have to face different uh, methodologies and research tools. So there are courses and seminars. The second year is uh, devoted to the research period abroad from a period of, of six or nine months. The third year is dedicated to thesis writing and, if possible, also to the thesis defense session. If students uh, can, they are able to conclude their uh, PhD course the third year. Otherwise, there is the fourth year where the thesis submission process starts and ends with the defense session. Next slide. Thank you. Our course are based on different uh, research fields. Uh, there are um, courses of history, philosophy, institutional juridical courses, uh, economics management, management, or information technology applied to counter heritage. Our courses are research oriented courses, mainly are just like seminars, and we are going to offer a contact with different research approaches. Our aim is just students' fields different perspective on the field of cultural heritage, different methodologies and tools. Then some of our courses are very practical or practical oriented, oriented courses and activities. It means that we have uh, lessons inside museums, for example, or uh, laboratories, and we are going to offer involvement uh, to our students, involvement in ongoing research projects of a different kind, both at the local, national, and international level. Next slide. Uh, these are an overview of the main research topics uh, of our area and both of our research, I mean the research of uh, developed by the professor and researchers, but also uh, research uh, topic of our PhD thesis. So from problem of difficult heritage, memory, space and identities, uh, to the man management of cultural heritage and to the cultural heritage practice and institution where we have this sort of a uh, very important research field on tourism as a social or as a social cultural practice. It means also our research and going on the problem of permanent and temporary exhibition or event. And then we have, uh, uh, so to say, a much more physiological philosophical oriented kind of uh, topics uh, around the image and its uh, nature. So image art and science from antiquity to the present time, the reception of images, uh, the space production and its reception, and then the space analysis and the language and text analysis and related problems. Next slide. Uh, our aim is to provide students with a background uh, that they can spend both in academic career and profession in the field of cultural heritage. Uh, in this slide, I'm going to uh, to list just a few of the institutions where our students are currently working, from the London Archaeological Museum to the Kupferstick Cabinet in Berlin, to the Law School, University of Notre Dame in Indiana, Durham University, and University College London. Next slide. In fact, our placement is uh, very good at the moment. Uh, uh, analysis and management of cultural heritage students are uh, currently working uh, for institution, for university, or for company, uh, mainly for institutions and university. But what is relevant for us, and the next slide, is that we have a very, very high, uh, we have a very high results in placement for out of 78 PhD students at the moment, in Italy and 28 abroad and four uh, they uh, didn't reply to our to our uh, query so we don't know if they are working or not so it's a very very good placement at the moment and it's very important for us after 10 years of activity the next slide I'm going to uh, introduce briefly the members of our uh, community 
Maria Luisa Catoni, you already met her. Uh, she is the director of the Research Unique Links and the PhD coordinator. She's full professor in classical archaeology. Professor Lorenzo Cassini is full professor in the legislation of counter heritage, and Professor Amo Bertolacci is Amos Bertolacci is full professor in history of medieval philosophy. Next slide. It's the union faculty. Uh, the Professor Linda Bertelli is assistant professor in visual studies of science, and she's responsible for seminar and work, workshop coordinator of the research unit links. Yashim Tonga is assistant professor in analysis and management of counter heritage. She graduated at IMT in 2014, so she is one of uh, the former students of our community. Next slide. Uh, you are the archaeologist Riccardo Olivito and the Alessandro Poggio, both of them assistant professor in archaeology, and Silvia Di Vincenzo, who is assistant professor in history of medieval philosophy. Next slide, we have the, uh, our jurist Andrea Verardi and Andrea Magliari, both of them assistant professor in administrative law and in administrative law. And then uh, the last researcher that joined our community, uh, Ruggero Longo, is assistant professor in art history, in particular medieval art history. Next slide. Uh, there are uh, some professors who, during the last 10 years, help us to shape our PhD track and are involved with courses and participation in our research activity. Professor Stefano Baiacurioni, a professor in economics and history at Bocconi University, and Professoressa Paola Dubini, professor of economics uh, at the Bocconi University too, and uh, Andrea Zocchi, uh, who is former McKinsey director, who is holding course in, at IMT in problem solving. Next slide. There are also uh, visiting professor who joined our community in the last year, and we uh, we are very proud to have them with us. Professor Karl Brando Strelke and professor of history of early modern and modern art is emeritus curator at Philadelphia Museum of Art, and Carlo Ginzburg, that and anyone knows, is historian, former professor at Scuola Normale Superiore, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, and many other uh, uh, important institutions in the world. Next slide. Uh, we have also in the last year uh, as visiting professor Massimo Zanna and Christian Greco and both uh, from the Parco Archeologico di Pompeii and the Museo Egizio in Turin and they are also uh, visiting professor in, at IMT so they are uh, giving seminars but also they are involved in uh, we, are, we are established in cooperation with their institution so our PhD track is establishing cooperation, common research project with those institutions. Next slide. Uh, in fact, uh, in those 10 years, we uh, expand a lot our network of institutional collaboration. And uh, it's very important for me to underline the fact that our collaboration starts from the territory, from Luca and its territory, I mean, Fondazione Paolo Cresci, uh, Luca Comics and Games, La Fondazione Casa di Risparmio di Luca, and then as uh, we have a lot of cooperation at an inter at national level, for example, with many of the superintendenze or Poli Museali, from Polo Museale della Toscana, Polo Museale del Lazio, Superintendenza Polo Museale del Friuli Venezia Giula, Superintendenza di, eh, della, de, de Capitolina, and at an, at an international level, with many research institutes like, like the Central Institute in München or Croatian Academy of Science, and many of, of our professors or also uh, uh, researchers are involved in an international project uh, at an international level. Last slide. Uh, it's my uh, last one. Uh, I would like to thank you very much for uh, being here, even if it's in a virtual space. And I really hope that this situation we will end very soon. And I really hope that we will meet together again in our campus in Luca, because one of the strength of IMT is like it's a, a campus-based university. So the life of the campus is very important. And I'm sure that very soon we will 
uh, meet together in San Francesco in Lucca. Thank you. We invite Professor Emiliano Ricciardi to present the curriculum in Cognitive, Computational and Social Neurosciences, which is under the Cognitive and Cultural Systems PhD program. Welcome, uh, good morning everybody, uh, welcome to IMT. Uh, today I uh, would like to introduce you briefly to the topics uh, of uh, research and education that we are offering in our specific track of cognitive computational and social neurosciences that overlaps with the activity of the MOMILAB research unit. Uh, when we enter, and my students already are familiar with this kind of framework, when we enter neuroscience and how they are applied to the, uh, to the description of uh, how we interact with the external world, uh, we have to make clear that the observation and the way we represent the world could be observed at a different level. And uh, uh, today, you know, what we aim to do is to uh, integrate uh, basic neuroscience, thus information that comes even from a genetic or cellular level, to uh, tools typical of experimental psychology, cognitive neuroscience and brain imaging, thus to have the possibility to describe the different phenomena of how we interact with the external world in a broader way at the different levels of observation. Obviously, uh, within the trap, we are trying to uh, capture and to catch all different trends at, at, at you know, the hot topics in neuroscience that currently characterize neuroscience research. And just let me remind you, you know, for those of you that are more familiar, you know, the tight correlation that nowadays we are living between the novel description of uh, structural and functional neuroarchitecture of the human brain. And it's quite amazing how novel tools where we are able to actually look at the living human brain are actually offering such a novel way of describing uh, physiological brain and pathological brain activity. Uh, we are in the era of connectivity, we are in the era of the internet, and thus, you know, we cannot, uh, uh, we cannot exclude the way of uh, looking at our brain as a big network, a big uh, network whose areas, whose different parts with a specific function are able to integrate and communicate and to process information that gathers from the external world or also think at the big explosion of uh, large sample and large repository that nowadays are offering uh, in, and share uh, pieces of information, uh, experimental observation that allows researchers really to uh, provide with a large data scale uh, uh, observation, ten hundreds of thousands of, of, of uh, information that could be merged together uh, with the tools of uh, uh, large data analytics or networks analysis, okay? And let's get also to what are some kind of frontiers and application of research, like, you know, neurofeedback or artificial intelligence or brain-computer interfaces. So the idea of capturing brain activity and to transfer this activity to external devices, okay? So are we really getting to observe the world in such a way where we could use neuroscience for everything? You know, in our track, we are not really supporting the idea of new everything. You know, don't look for this book, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a fake. So, but, you know, just like the idea of this, having a book telling you a short history of new everything. We are not going into that and we are not really supporting the idea of skepticism or approach to uh, enter the prefix neurons toward our disciplines. But I would like to provide you with some uh, examples, few examples that we are actually pursuing here at the school of how neuroscience could dialogue with other disciplines, okay? Let me take this example first. You know, a few years ago, we've been interacting with, and still uh, doing, interacting with people working on robotics and looking how we can uh, actually regulate our uh, bionic hands, uh, you know, is being inspired by our real hand, okay? And looking at that part of the cortex that for those that are familiar is the motor cortex, we are being able to discover an alphabet, alphabet that could be merged together to uh, form words that represent the different grasping of information. And that really oversimplified the way we could read in the brain and look how this information could be conveyed to an external device and to connect 
the information we get from the brain to something like a robotic hand or some other uh, external tools. The way of simplifying is something that we also recently use in another uh, interaction uh, with external world that is our social life, the study of emotion. And specifically, the social and affecting neuroscience group has been, been able recently to find and to spot a specific brain regions whose ability is to simply exploit three simple gradients to describe all the wide gamut of emotion that we can currently express. This is a big challenge even for artificial intelligence if you think about systems that could be developed to recognize emotion. But that's very interesting. And it's a line of research that we're pursuing. And this is something that we are currently developing our dialogue with this uh, uh, bionics uh, robot, you know, and um, this is really the, the human robot interaction is a topic uh, uh, of, of interest for our research. And now the research in neuroscience could be transferred to bionics or to bioengineering. This is another example, you know, we, we don't need uh, always to look at the brain to uh, get information how we process the external world. We could just rely on pieces of information that might be very simple. And this is a project we are uh, conducting together with the cultural heritage group, looking at specifically how we perceive the images of space and monuments in Roman kinds. And it's quite typical uh, to see the, and to cap capture how different high movements really focusing on these different aspects and these different elements of perception actually uh, represent and mirrors cognitive aspects on which we, which we process external information with which we uh, uh, represent the external world. And this could be transferred to several aspects, uh, could be related to a cognitive uh, elements. And this is something that we are currently doing with a lab that has been developed in collaboration with the, one of the major European bank, Intesa San Paolo. And this is an example of how traders could be monitored according to their cognitive styles. And this is very important because neuroscience is able to enter into the world of organization of management of uh, human resources. And this is quite typical uh, examples of the challenges we are currently doing. This is uh, something that should uh, foster a change of perspective. We are not just merely in describing how our brain process decision making, how we uh, go towards education and learning new aspects, but we try to use neuroscience to impact these tools. And this is an example of how, for instance, uh, virtual reality could be exploited. And specifically, you know, we can look at some regions specifically involved in those processes and use this information to impact education, for instance, in this case, in a, in a big corporate. But, you know, we can even go in to describe even social behavior or socioeconomical behavior at a larger scale. And here we'd like to mention a, a, a specific project we are currently doing with uh, uh, colleagues of the, uh, of the economy uh, area with uh, computer science and networks areas. And here we are studying specific behavior that is pro-social behavior. And the specific example uh, comes from blood donation. And here is an example of how blood donors could be merely change their behavior. And here we are talking about hundreds of, of thousands of blood donors that merely could uh, change their behavior according to specific external reward we are providing to them. And this is a way we are aiming to describe uh, neuroscience and psychology could be used to describe and uh, specifically uh, depict uh, peculiar aspects of uh, large socioeconomic phenomena. And just let me tackle these last aspects. Uh, our group is also uh, uh, famous uh, worldwide to uh, study the physiology of sleep. And it's quite important to use the sleep as a model to affect behavior and specific decision-making. This is something that actually we are currently exploiting both towards the description of uh, social interaction and uh, specific in organizational neuroscience to see how it could affect performances. So I hope to convince you that these may be examples of how neuroscience could actually dialogue and contaminate other disciplines and being contaminated at the same time uh, by other disciplines in a very fruitful way. And this multidisciplinary approach is something that as the director and Maria Luisa Catoni uh, re reminded us is, is peculiar to our school. If you want to figure out, you know, aspects related to be more to the organization of our research line of, uh, you know, placement or collaboration, please visit our, our uh, website, 
that has been just renovated. But really the spirit I've just been presenting today is something that we decline uh, across different aspects of our education research and third mission. Similar to other tracks, our uh, students come from a very different wide gamut of of background, so not just psychology and neuroscience, but really going towards of humanity, philosophy, economy, physics. We also had an architect in, the, in, in our previous, uh, in, uh, among our previous alumni. And typically, you know, the way we describe our our uh, educational uh, offer is mainly related to a core teaching, mainly related to uh, getting acquainted with methodologies and topics in neuroscience, but then being contaminated towards either advanced process analyzing data and looking at data, or to be contaminated by the other uh, topic and, and disciplines. And again, the four here tracks is now useful to fully get uh, your research projects uh, completed. We have different topics of research uh, that really uh, uh, cover uh, a, a large extent of uh, neuroscience going from computation to cognitive and to the fact in neuroscience. One thing that I would like to, uh, to highlight for all the students is really the facilities. Some are external to the school, but we really, in the last few months, we have been able to build up a lab here in San Ponciano where we could acquire behavioral and electrophysiological measures. So this is something that is actually used as you figure out but all, uh, but all disciplines. And also, uh, one other good aspect is the kind of financial and international fundings we are able to attract to support our research projects. We also love really exploiting the dissemination and third, uh, third mission activities. And this is something that we are willing then to involve you in the future. And, you know, Bright is the next uh, is an act, uh, appointment, but then we have the, the Brain Awareness Week and several other moments in our uh, uh, academic year where we interact with, uh, uh, you know, with uh, people uh, to disseminate our research. Let me just briefly, before I'm going to conclude, to present the people that work in the MAMI lab. You know, you already know the director. You also have uh, Professor uh, Gustavo Cevolani, uh, professor in the philosophy of science. We also have different assistant professor, Giulio Bernardi, Davide Bottari, Luca Polonio, Luca Cecchetti, that covers different aspects of research. We have a senior staff fellow, uh, that is Jack Manjaras, and then we have several other uh, postdocs that support our research. We are really happy to, uh, uh, to gather together students coming from different parts of, of the world, and again, with different backgrounds. Really, this has been represented a major, a major addition to, uh, our, uh, to our community. Let me just thank you all for being here today and to, uh, you know, to welcome you again. I'm looking forward to start interacting with all of you in a much more uh, intense way. Thank you. We now give the floor to Professor Rocco De Nicola to present the PhD program in Systems Science. <laughs> Professor De Nicola, sorry, we can hear you. Could you please turn on your microphone? Okay, good, good, perfect. This is, uh, so I will put the slideshow on, play from current slide, and I was saying that I will be very, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, good. So, this is Rocco De Nicola. I'm the coordinator of the, the PhD program in System Science. I will be very brief because uh, Professoressa Catoni already said uh, a lot of things about the PhD and the challenges that are that you will be facing uh, during the, the three four years that you will uh, you will spend with us. And my colleagues Alberto Bemborad and Massimo Riccaboni will uh, go into the detail of the, the PhD program. As um, Maria Luisa Catoni was uh, was saying, I mean there are two PhD programs one uh, coordinated by her on cognitive and cultural systems, the other one uh, 
um, uh, on systems science, which I coordinate. And this one is uh, structured again in two parts. One is more computer science and engineering, and the other one is economics, but uh, economics, which has also a, a, netto a, a network part and a business part. We, the two PhD programs have roughly the same, the same structure. They have some core courses, some advanced courses. They use different names, but essentially they mean the same, and they have seminars. But also, these two PhD have some reading groups that are, uh, that are in common. For example, last year we had a long-lasting um, uh, reading group on blockchain, which, of course, has a lot of is important from the computer science point of view, but is also important from the economical point of view because blockchain then is the technology behind the uh, Bitcoin. And we had also common courses about cybersecurity and, and, and so on. One thing I, I want to say, I mean, is that these rectangles anyway, they should not be seen as borders. I mean, borders, the way we conceive them are there to be violated, okay? and rectangles have to be contaminated. And this is the advantage of being in a school like, like ours. I mean, if I even think of my experience, I mean, one of the last two publications that I've, I've had is one on physics. I'm a computer scientist, I'm an old computer scientist, which started studying computer science uh, in the, uh, the beginning of the 70s, in fact. And I would never thought that I will publish in physics communication on one end and journal of tourism on the, on the other end. I mean, and this will not, would, not, would have never happened in my old university. I've been in Florence, in, in Rome, and so on. It was only because of the atmosphere of the colleague, of the students, because students were involved also in this, in this paper that were with us, that allowed us to, uh, to, to publish this, uh, this, this kind of thing. And so my, my real indication is try and, 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 and communicate. It will be a real add-on. The fact that you will learn from other disciplines will be really, really very, very important from, from us. And, uh, uh, and also, I mean, really, it is these four years for you will be really, I mean, unforgettable. I mean, uh, we have done, uh, I mean, all of us have done a PhD, but as a supervisor, I really have seen many PhD students. And it's incredible the way they change. When, when they enter the program and when they exit. And they exit better, but you can, if you work hard and if you do not stay close in your discipline, you interact with the other, you will be even much, much better. And this is the only thing I want, uh, I want to, to say, and I leave the, the scene now to Alberto Bemporad for the computer science and system, system engineering uh, um, track, followed by... Uh, Massimo Riccabone for the other track. Thank you very, very much. E quindi? Li devo dire qualcosa, quindi? Ok. Ok. We now invite Professor Alberto Bempora to give his presentation of the curriculum in computer science and systems engineering, which is under the System Science PhD program. Okay, uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, I, I hope you can hear me. So welcome yes, um, everybody, in particular to the new PhD students. Uh, you're starting a very important period in your professional and also personal life. They will largely contribute to shape your uh, future life. My name is Alberto Bempet. I'm a professor at IMT 
And I will give you now some details about the PhD track in computer science and systems engineering in, term, in terms of both uh, our research activities and the teaching uh, offer. So in a nutshell, as a, um, as a curriculum in system science, in computer science and systems engineering, um, we are providing the quantitative methods um, to model, uh, simulate, and analyze the security and reliability of systems and also optimize and control systems. I talk about systems, uh, I mean a variety of, um, of um, real life situations which um, could be of industrial type, like a vehicle or an economic system or a social system. So what these systems have in common are the possibility to be investigated by quantitative methods and um, at IMT, we have three research units that will now describe in some more details. Um, DISCO for dynamical system control and optimization, MUSAM, this scale system analysis and materials, and the system system analysis, system modeling and analysis. Uh, basically, our backgrounds are in systems and control, in computational mechanics, and in computer science. <laughs> And in terms of uh, um, education, we, we have currently 43 PhD students enrolled in the CSSE program. Their background is from computer science, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, chemical engineering, and math. And in the last call, about more than actually one fourth of the applications were for computer science and systems engineering. We have been also quite active in terms of attracting the external funding uh, which brought to IMT in the last nine years about 6.6 .6 million euros in uh, research money. So let me start with um, the research unit, uh, DISCO, which uh, I'm uh, leading systems and control engineering. So our mission in a real nutshell is to develop models from data that explain the dynamics of the system and also advanced control algorithms that can make the systems react autonomously, safely, and, and optimally. So typically you have a system, uh, so the real process you want to control, and uh, what we want, what we actually investigate in our research and what we teach in our courses is, in, is how to derive dynamical models from data and how to uh, optimize based on these models the behavior of the system so that the system spontaneously based on measurements from sensors okay it can uh, behave in the way you want for example a car is driving uh, autonomously without it driving on road without hitting anybody applications are not only in the automotive domain that we investigate but also in uh, several others these are quite um, uh, there is a quite a wide um, areas of application for the methodologies that we investigate, for example, in space, energy, and process control, in finance, and, and others. Uh, the main uh, research topics that we uh, investigate are modern predictive control uh, of dynamical systems, so control of system based on uh, optimization, the numerical algorithms for solving the optimization problems in real time in embedded uh, electronic platforms, and also machine learning and system identification techniques for getting the model that you need to optimize the behavior of the system from, uh, from recorded data or streaming data. This is our research agenda. So we are currently investigating machine learning techniques for modeling systems, uh, reinforcement learning to try to get the control algorithms directly from data without going through models and also uh, different types of numerical optimization algorithms, uh, not only for convex optimization, but also for non-linear and non-convex global optimization that we use for our um, control design techniques. So again, these are, we don't have a particular application domain. We are, uh, we have many, we, we actually multidisciplinary by, by definition because we need to interact with the uh, domain experts to, to develop our, our technologies. Um, it's currently me in the unit. Um, my Zanon, who is an um, assistant professor, uh, one researcher at Sobu City, and we have 12 PhD students currently in our unit. 
uh, about one third is, uh, is Italian, the rest is coming from different places. We have been very active um, the last five, six years on publications, and most of the publications um, that we do are actually co-authored by students. So we really push our students to um, not, not only to take courses, but also to um, write papers and publish papers. Um, we have been attracting quite some funding from the European Union and from the Ministry, and also IMT's first spin-off uh, was funded in 2011, um, came out of our research uh, group. Now let me um, let me talk about the research unit SISMA, System Modeling and Analysis. Uh, Professor Elko de Nicola is leading the unit. We just spoke before, Mirko Toibastone, and um, Gabriele Letegno, Fabio, Luca Caedelli is a visiting professor, and they uh, have few, 15 PhD students. They, um, what they uh, um, do in terms of research and also courses is to investigate formal methods uh, to analyze systems, and in particular to analyze, it, to analyze whether the system is safe and the software that is implementing the system executes correctly. And uh, with this, um, they address uh, a lot of different research topics. Um, one in particular that uh, was developed um, uh, recently, which is very attracting a lot of attention is cybersecurity and, and many other topics and uh, applications. They're also very active in publishing uh, papers and also papers co-authored by students. Um, CISMA has uh, uh, many research uh, projects, both in fundamental research and also in uh, applied research. Uh, here you have lists from the European Union and from the, from the ministry, Italian Ministry of Research, and also from region Tuscany, there are a few um, applied research projects together with uh, companies, in particular with uh, companies of, uh, uh, in the region around us in, uh, in Lucca. Um, it is also um, quite an interdisciplinary research environment as they are applying their tools to a variety of, uh, of problems. Uh, for example, lately there have been um, projects uh, funded internally at IMT uh, to, um, to apply these tools to uh, understand uh, fake news and to uh, help the, um, the management of cultural systems and also in other, in other research areas. And as I was mentioning, cybersecurity, the, the group is very active. Actually, it's, uh, it's one of the leaders uh, in a, at the regional level, also at the national level on this uh, emerging, emerging topic. Um, the last um, of, the, of the three research units is uh, MUSA. Um, so it's computational mechanics. They are investigating methods to um, model and analyze um, systems, in particular uh, materials and uh, other types of mechanical systems and, and structures. The unit is led by Professor Marco Faggi and uh, Pietro Renaida is assistant professor in the group. And there is a group of eight, 11 students uh, currently enrolled. And um, since the, um, Marco Faggi joined IMT, uh, already five PhD students have graduated from, uh, from IMT. Uh, they have a lot of uh, international collaborations with different uh, universities in Europe and uh, worldwide. And in particular, um, the Muslim Lab is um, the laboratory at IMT for uh, doing experiments on, on materials, which has been um, created thanks to the funding received by Professor Faggi from the European Research Council. Uh, as I was mentioning, the uh, research activities uh, rely um, on, the, on their uh, abilities, scientific abilities and experimental abilities to model, simulate and analyze um, different types of, uh, of materials. And here you see many, many uh, examples of, uh, of them. But actually the, the tools that they use with materials can be also used 
as uh, to analyze other type of, uh, of systems, for example, uh, economic system, we have a project running uh, funded by uh, IMP on, uh, on this. Um, also the unit is also very active in terms of uh, research um, publications. Uh, also most of the papers are in uh, collaboration with the PhD students and has received considerable uh, funding from the European Union and also at the national uh, level. And also since recently, last year, the research unit um, um, created a spin-off called Tree Towers that is, um, is trying to bring their uh, know-how into, into real um, industrial um, settings. Now, in terms of uh, teaching, um, here is a list of the courses that you, as new PhD students, have probably seen in detail in the last days while preparing their study program. So we, we distinguish um, between the foundational courses covering the basics of our disciplines that um, contribute to the program and the advanced courses, which are more, um, uh, say, specific for the discipline and of more interest for those who are in, um, in the discipline. And also, um, Michael Paggi is, uh, is giving a um, long uh, seminar on um, funding and management of uh, research and intellectual property that is not really um, domain specific, but actually applies to, to uh, research and IP in, uh, in general. What happens uh, after um, our PhD students complete their the program and graduate? So here you see some, some names of, of uh, our past students, our alumni, um, many of them go to academia in Italy and abroad. Uh, many of them go to industry, uh, some in spin-offs, in our spin-offs, some uh, in, uh, in uh, important research cent industrial research uh, centers in Italy and, and uh, worldwide. And uh, also our postdocs and assistant professors after they have uh, spent some time at IMP and uh, left for, for better jobs, they uh, also go into nice, uh, nice, they find very good um, location to continue their career in uh, universities and, and companies. Okay, so that uh, concludes my, my presentation. Thanks and welcome again. We now invite Professor Massimo Recaboni to present the curriculum in economics, networks, and business analytics, which is under the System Science PhD program. Uh, so, hello, good morning to everybody. I hope you can see my slides. Um, so, uh, the goal of my presentation today is to describe and introduce the PhD track in economics, networks, and business analytics. Um, so, uh, actually, the PhD tracks, uh, track in uh, economics, networks, and business analytics uh, is one of the oldest of the school. Uh, it has been started uh, in the, the first cycle, was the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the founding year of the school, 2005. Um, as the PhD track, which have been uh, um, already presented, uh, um, the, this one is also an interdisciplinary PhD track. So students come from different backgrounds in economics, of course, but also from management, statistics, math, physics, computer science, uh, and decision sciences. And most of students are Italian, uh, but we have uh, foreign students for all over the world. Um, um, so in uh, preparing the presentation, and since I said, uh, as I said, uh, the, the PhD track in economics is as old as the IMT school, um, I, I prefer to, uh, to do the presentation, let's say, from the inside out. Uh, so the goal of the presentation today is to, of course, tell you something about uh, economics at IMT, which, by the way, has been uh, ranked as the best department in economics of, uh, of economics in Italy twice. Uh, during the national evaluation uh, of economic excellence and, and performance. 
but my goal is uh, mostly to go back uh, to the all the cycles of the PSC track in economics and related disciplines to show to you uh, what happened to students uh, after they, uh, they left the school and back to the world and to demonstrate uh, what uh, we achieved in terms uh, you know, of the impact on, on society and, and research worldwide. So I, I, I'll do it uh, as fast as I can. I don't want to take too much time on this. So let's start from the first cycle students or so graduates. Uh, in the first cycle were uh, 12 uh, students at IMT and they published a total of uh, 67 publications according to Scopus. And uh, some of the notable uh, alumni of that cycle are Maria Bigoni. Maria Bigoni, she's already a full professor at the University of Bologna. Not only that, she's now the director uh, of the PhD program of economics at the University of Bologna, and she's the youngest uh, female uh, professor, full professor of economics in Italy. Uh, other two uh, students of that cycle are now professors. Uh, Maria Elena Filippelli, she's professor at the University of Sapienza in Rome, and Luigi Moretti is Metro Confer the Conference uh, at the Sorbonne University in Paris. And uh, moving to the next cycle, uh, we, uh, we had less uh, last students, only five, with 11 publications, and uh, one of those students, uh, Costanza Russo, she's now senior lecturer at Queen Mary University in London. And uh, she's also now uh, leading the PhD program in law uh, of the Queen Mary University. Um, uh, the next cycle, uh, nine students, nine graduates, uh, they published already uh, about 50, uh, 50 publications. And uh, one of those uh, uh, graduate um, students uh, is now a lecturer at the University of Florida. And uh, Irene Mammi, she's a tenure track assistant professor at the University of Venezia. And Luisa Gagliardi, she's an assistant professor in Bocconi. Uh, the, uh, the 24th cycle of the program in economics uh, and markets and institutions uh, well, had uh, 60 uh, students. Uh, they published a 58 pub publication in, in uh, scientific journals. And uh, uh, three students are, uh, have already become uh, professors, uh, one at the University of Bremen in Germany, and uh, one in Italy, it's Giovanni Marui, uh, who is now associate professor at the University of Urbino. And uh, Alznur Alstomar uh, is associate professor of the University of Izmir in Turkey. Uh, next cycle, uh, well, this is a more recent cycle, of course, the 25th cycle. Uh, there were seven students with uh, 37 publications and professor uh, Mario Modica is now a tenure track assistant professor at the Grand Sasso Science Institute, as you know, is one of the, um, uh, the high school uh, institution in Italy. And other um, you know, students of that cycle have uh, became you know, researchers in different institutions around the world, including the OECD in Paris uh, and the University of Pisa. Let's move on again. Uh, so the 26th cycle of the doctoral program, uh, you know, there were uh, seven graduates, uh, there's seven graduates uh, with uh, 35 publications in Scopus. Uh, one of them, Riccardo Di Clemente, uh, has recently become lecturer at the University of Exeter in the UK. Alessandro Bermolte is a colleague of ours in Luca. He's an assistant professor in Luca who recently has been habilitated uh, for us uh, to the role of assistant professor in economics. Uh, and Olga Chiappinelli, she's a researcher at Eve Berlin in Germany. And uh, other students of the same cycle, they are at the JRC of the European Commission in IBM, uh, in uh, the role of data scientist and Swiss, which is an insurance company, Swiss insurance company. Uh, well, the next cycle uh, was, uh, only four, uh, four students at a time. Uh, they have 10 publications. One of them, Tiziano Di Stefano, is now a researcher at the University of Pisa and he recently published a book on uh, the environmental impact uh, of economic processes. Uh, next cycle again, this is the 28th cycle. 
there were seven uh, seven students uh, who are and yeah now have uh, a role uh, in the university uh, and and the private sector. Uh, notably, Luca Trapin is now a tenure track assistant professor at the University of Bologna. Uh, and Andrea Froh is a researcher at the Polytechnic School, the Polytechnic of Milan. I'm almost done with it, so only a few more slides, because we are getting to the most recent cycles. Uh, well, uh, for the 29th cycle, uh, there's been eight uh, uh, students and then with eight publications. And Laura Gianfania, uh, she is now advisor to the vice president of the European Investment Bank. Uh, and uh, most of the students of that cycle are now uh, postdocs. They have postdoc position at different uh, research institutions uh, um, in Italy, university and research institution. And one of them founded a spin off company, uh, uh, IMT, uh, or IMT uh, spin off company. Uh, the, the next cycle, well, we start graduating students with a double degree with the University of Leuven. Uh, Giovanna D'Inverno was one of the first uh, students uh, who received the double degree. And she's now a FW fellow at KU Leuven. Uh, Luca Mantegazza uh, is a researcher at the University of Florida. And Yuan Gao, she's lecturer at the University of Istanbul. Uh, this is, a, well, I have only put more slides like that, so this is the 30, uh, first cycle of, uh, uh, it wasn't a different name, it was named at the time, Economics Management Data Science, and we, it was a strong emphasis of data science, and some of the alumni of that cycle, they have now a role uh, as data scientists uh, in the private sector and public sector, uh, one of them is Luca Vergina. Uh, or, uh, who is now a postdoc at uh, ATH Zurich in Switzerland. And finally, this is the very last, uh, for the cycle number 32, uh, we have, uh, as for now, only two uh, students graduated. Uh, one is Falco Bargagli Stoffi, uh, who holds a postdoc at Harvard University, uh, Harvard Data Science Initiative. Uh, he started it very recently. And the second one, Yanni, the writer, uh, has got a position in Alliance, uh, which is an insurance company, of course, based in Munich. So uh, this is uh, to sum up uh, what uh, has been done uh, in uh, this area of research at the school uh, since the very beginning, since year 2005. As a total, uh, uh, 81 student graduate I uh, got a PhD in economics and related disciplines. Uh, of them, uh, 10 uh, have uh, now a role as professors, who are full professor, who has five associate professors, uh, and, uh, and three uh, colleagues, uh, they have the position, which is an Italian system called RTDB, which is essentially a tenure track associate uh, professor position, which will uh, um, evolve into uh, an associate professor uh, in, um, in a three year time. Uh, and uh, overall, uh, they published 358 uh, uh, publications corpus. So this um, brings us to an average of about 4.4 uh, publications each, uh, which is quite high. Uh, and I think this is a, a signal of quality, but also you know, the, the fact that we are performing very well in terms of research outcome. Uh, not just uh, the IMT school, but students and, and graduates. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, you see uh, some pie charts showing that, you know, most of students are employed in Italy, but, you know, about one out of three uh, students uh, is employed abroad and uh, is gender balanced. And finally, you see that the uh, main occupation is in the in industry, uh, sorry, in the, at the university and research institutes, but some students are uh, also employed in the private sector especially in uh, the banking insurance sector uh, and as a role, increasingly as a role of data scientist. Um, so this is, uh, this is it. Thank you for your attention. And uh, of course, we will have a chance you know, to talk about you know, our activity at the school. But what's very important is that um, we really believe that you know, you're going to have a, 
hard time uh, with classes in your first year, uh, but it's really essential, uh, you know, to train you and, uh, and uh, get you exposed to different disciplines uh, and prepare you for the job market. Thank you very much again. And welcome to IMT. We now give the floor to the administrative director of the school, Giulio Bolzonetti, to give his address. Good morning to everyone. Let me introduce myself. I'm uh, Giulio Bolzonetti, administrative director of IMT School of Advanced Studies. Uh, on behalf of the entire administrative uh, body of the school, I am very happy to welcome you here in Luca and in the IMT School premises. I prepare some uh, some. So just a few slides, a short presentation uh, to quickly give you uh, an image on how uh, the um, structure of administrative body is, and uh, to give you even uh, some information about uh, who look for or uh, what to do if you need an help during your period here. Um, that's the first slide. Uh, once again, welcome. And uh, there are my contacts here. Um, uh, in my personal way of thinking, um, as a, a public employee, I'm a civil servant. So it's uh, my precise duty to uh, give the means for uh, reach for me, uh, write to me, and uh, uh, talk to me. So uh, please take note of them uh, just in case. Uh, with this uh, slide, I want to introduce you some key features of uh, uh, the anti-school, uh, especially important for you as a student. Uh, I mean uh, the student representative, uh, there are three as a C, uh, and they sit on the uh, principal board of the school. Eric Ordali is a member of the uh, Board of Governors, that in Italian we say Consiglio di Amministrazione. Livia Baldinelli sits in the Academic Senate, il Senato Accademico, and uh, Cedric Zucchiatti is the member of Assessment Board, that is uh, Nucleo di Valutazione. I underline that uh, students have the chance to uh, choose their representative for each cycle, so uh, they will be able to uh, get in touch with the representative and uh, uh, explain uh, doubts, uh, concern, and uh, ideas about PhD programs and uh, the services that uh, in general the school gives. Uh, it's easier uh, for you to talk with them. They are students. They are inside the school uh, uh, for more time. And uh, so they can act uh, effectively to help you. Uh, I want to underline the Joint Students and Teachers Board too, because uh, in Italian Commissione Paritetica Docenti Studenti is the board in which sits uh, both students and professors. And uh, what is the duty? Is to uh, be the internal evaluator of the education offer, educational offering of the school. And, even uh, uh, the monitors the quality of uh, the quality of students of uh, the academic programs and student services. So it's all meant to uh, even more improve services and didactics of the school. Uh, you find here the, the, the email address, so to get in touch with them, uh, there's a, a mean. Uh, a short glance to our administrative organization, the, the head is the administrative director, that's me, but I don't work alone. Uh, and uh, I have many groups around me that help uh, and support me. 
and uh, I don't go through uh, the, the entire slide, but I underline you that uh, uh, there are eight offices. I think some of them you met already. Perhaps uh, PhD in either education at the time of your enrollment and campus management and front office when you get your accommodation and came here in, uh, in Luca. You can go through some information about the administrative organization, checking our website if you want. And even if you want, we will be pleased of it if uh, you came here in uh, Ex Boccherini building, we call so the, the, the place where uh, central administrative offices are located. Uh, the, the, the address is Piazza San Ponziano 6. So came and have a look at, uh, at us and how we work for you. Um, another slide for me is very important because uh, the services uh, that school offers uh, both students and uh, staff uh, is uh, the psychological support uh, service and uh, is structured into um, mainstream uh, the welcome interviews and the brief psychological consultation about uh, this uh, uh, last uh, stream uh, it is possible to carry it out individually or as a group. Um, I want to uh, reassure you that uh, no personal or sensible data will be widespread uh, using these services because uh, the email address you find in the slide is uh, read only by people in charge of the services. So no chance to widespread data, uh, personal or sensible data. Um, I think that is uh, the last slide. So, uh, as I said, I will be very short. Um, but it's about uh, anti-corruption. Um, the school uh, pursue a policy uh, the, to, to bring on the, the activities in an honest and ethical manner. Uh, this is important for us, and so uh, consequently we take a zero tolerance approach to bribery and corruption. And uh, I beg you, if you become aware that the illicit behaviors or bribery offenses are taking place uh, here, uh, please report it uh, promptly to the uh, email address you find uh, uh, here. And so, I go on to, to the end of my presentation, but once more, I would welcome you. Uh, recommend to ask, um, even, uh, even if you are in difficulties, you need an help, please be free or ask us because we are here to help you. And so thanks for your attention and once again, welcome. We now invite the president of the IMT School Student and Alumni Association, Davide Baccio, to give his remarks. Okay, good morning and welcome to the Six Cycle. Uh, let me start by saying that we're certainly living difficult times and this is really not the usual welcome day. There is uh, nothing usual in this year. But my first message is that there is nothing usual in, in you as well. Okay? You're here because you have the intellectual skills, the determination, the creativity to face the, the inherent uncertainty in the challenges of doing research, okay? of tackling unsolved puzzles, of advancing knowledge. And I have no doubt that those very same skills will serve you well also to confront and address the challenges of this, uh, this peculiar year. Okay? Where of course, peculiar is an exercise in understatement. Mm, my second message is a very warm welcome to the IMT alumni community. Uh, 
And I'm not getting it wrong, okay, when I say alumni, because this is your first day as an alumni. You are, of course, a student of this school, but you're a student of the IMT only for three years, but you will be an alumni forever. So my invitation to you is to join the alumni community as soon as possible. Join the association today. You will be joining a community of already 170 members, which span from the 20th cycle, uh, which was my cycle actually, the first one in, in IMT, already 15 years ago, and now you can really get a sense of how, how old I am. And hopefully it will span all the cycles until yours, the 36th cycle, starting today, hopefully. And I'm not only inviting you to join the association, but also to help us in the association, help us building our activity. This is a young association, okay? It was funded uh, some four years ago, but it was actually started only, uh, only two years ago. So we really need your help to, and support to grow. And of course, we have something we can offer you in return, useful experience and come on, everybody needs to build a CV, okay? So that is something you can put on your CV. But we can also, and especially, supply you with connection. That's what a community is about. IMT, IMT alumni are uh, spread across the world, as we have heard also from Professor Riccaboni uh, presentation. Uh, they are university professors, they are researchers, but they are also CTOs. They are also vice presidents of a, of a uh, mm, several industries. They are members of parliament, national members of parliament, members of the European parliament. They are civil servants in European institutions, in national institutions. Th that's the network you want to link with. And those are people who have shared your, uh, your same experiences. They are willing to give back what they add from, from their experience in IMT. And because they all start where you're standing now, uh, well, metaphorically, because probably you're standing in your home right now due to the pandemic, and rest assured, we are not willing to invade your home. But we are all once some newly enrolled PhD students, and maybe like you're feeling a little bit lost in this strange new town, which is Luca, with those stunning walls and, and those countless churches, which I still remember. So get us, get to know us. Okay, get to know us and start by connecting to the association webpage, which is, by the way, hosted in the IMT school website. There you will find the membership forms, the contact emails to contact me, to contact uh, uh, the, rest, the rest of the board. Uh, the association is run by an executive board, which counts seven alumni and three current students. Okay, the, uh, the executive board uh, is in place until next year. Next year, we're gonna have the new election for the new board. There, on the IMT uh, alumni webpage, you also find the links to our community web pages in LinkedIn and Facebook, so that you can find traces of our past activities. Of course, you won't find the traces, the embarrassing pictures from the uh, nightly events of the reunion, because those are reserved to the, to the active members. But become an active member, so you will see those ones as well. So, uh, you will see that there that we run, or at least COVID permitting, we attempt to run yearly reunion, at least once a year, meet physically, join people that uh, live everywhere in the world and that uh, are brought back to Luca to network, to give back in case of more senior alumni to the younger ones, okay? And we are struggling to build more and more activities. And for that, we need your help. We need your brain. You, we need your legwork. Uh, we are building mentoring programs. We are trying to build other events and initiatives, uh, including links with other alumni association with other relevant uh, uh, university communities around the world. Okay. So please uh, join and help us. And he said, well, just let me conclude with a wish, okay? May your future research retain something from this COVID ex experience, okay? If only its ability to go viral. Thank you very much.
We now invite the student representatives to give their addresses. We first will be Rodolfo Gallardi, student for the 35th cycle from the Analysis and Management of Cultural Heritage Curriculum. So, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, well, I'm a bit near. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm a bit nervous, so <clears throat> please forgive me for possible mistakes. Um, I, I have to admit that I was surprised and also a bit scared when I was asked to give to give you this this speech today. Nonetheless, I'm really honored and thankful for have for having the opportunity of welcome you to the IMT, and I assure you that I'll do my best to accomplish this mission. I I will I'll try to be quick and not and not to annoy you too much. But first of all, I want to congratulate with uh, with you all for having conquered your spot in uh, in this school. I remember quite well when I got the news that I was going to be a PhD a fellow PhD here. But I well I didn't want to believe it. I was pretty shocked. But I can assure to you that you all earned uh, this place. So. Uh, and I would very much like uh, for you to start considering this place um, a bit as your home. I mean, well, in some way, I, I know that uh, due to the, of course, the situation that also um, all the, uh, the people that spoke before me has mentioned, uh, it's a bit difficult to do that. But I hope that sooner or later, uh, it uh, uh, you can, as I was saying, consider this place as at your home, and I also think that all uh, all of us from the previous cycles will do everything to to make this happen. Uh, you'll soon learn that we hold um, all of us we hold uh, in great consideration the idea of community and inclusion. Um, and as I was saying, I know that the moment we are living right now it goes some way in uh, in the opposite uh, direction. But we all hope that uh, once this situation uh, we are living will be over. Um, you will be able to at least to get to catch uh, a glimpse of uh, how enjoyable the campus life can be and i'm not referring to the only to the parties at least not only to the parties but uh, to the everyday life made of classes meetings games and by the way for when we will back to normal life i also invite for who is interested to, to well i wanted to to address the fact that we have also a football team and a, and a choir. I know that these are two activities that right now they seem like out of this world, but uh, if you're interested, of course, uh, give it a chance. Um, but well, uh, jokes aside, um, uh, we also have to remember that this is primarily a place for, uh, for research. Um, and it's in this specific department that the whole community, uh, IMT community, really, really shines. Uh, well, taking, well, to, speaking about my experience, uh, for example, I, when, before I got here, I was considering, my, considering myself only an archaeologist or, uh, or, well, as I like to say, an archaeologist wannabe. Um, and I was not, like, thinking outside of this possibility in, uh, in my life. Uh, but well, um, after, uh, with the classes, conferences, and sometimes even with the, the you know the normal, the simple chit chat, I started to, in some way, to question myself not only to on how to improve my my research, but I think this happens to to everyone. But um, but also on what else I could become once I'll be I'll be out of here. And right now, I see a lot of possibilities that before I didn't even think about. Well, uh, about all the possibilities given for from my track, I think that Professor Catoni and Professor Pellegrini uh, already spoke about uh, about all the possibilities that are given to us. Uh, but one thing that you all uh, should have clear in your minds is that you are students no more. Uh, you are researchers, and here you will be considered as such. This, of course, means great expectations, but it also means that uh, your ideas and opinions will always be taken into account. So don't ever be afraid to express yourself. And uh, well, as I said, there is this like dark side, these expectations on you, and it may not be an easy burden to carry. Sometimes you feel lost, will, you will at least feel lost, inadequate, 
you may even think that you don't belong here, but it's not true and you are not lost. It may be that you are only a wanderer and like someone maybe a bit more important and famous than me said, uh, all that is gold does not glitter, all, the, all those wander are not, uh, not all those wander are lost. The all that is strong does not wither, deep roots are not reached by the frost. So, well, uh, I'm sorry that I have to <laughs> disturb uh, Tolkien for this, but uh, you, yes, uh, this idea of having deep roots. So use all the tools that you have to deepen your roots. And one of the main tools that uh, you will get from here is, uh, well, it's quite simple. It's seeking for help. You, don't, should, you should never be afraid to ask, uh, to talk, to seek for advice. Whether it is a professor or a fellow researcher's door uh, that you are knocking on, you'll likely never receive, uh, frankly, I don't give a game then as an answer. And well, speaking as a, a cultural heritage um, PhD, PhD fellow, um, so from my point of view, as Professor Catoni already highlighted, I discovered that uh, often these help, these advices um, and suggestions that you are looking for may come from the most uh, unexpected side. Uh, so I guess, yes, that what, what this is what you mean by interdisciplinarity. So one last thing before I leave you to my other and probably less boring colleagues. Um, so um, starting from today, you have undertaken a new, um, fascinating, interesting journey that will, of course, challenge you, but also enrich you at the same time. So the path will be hard, but uh, in the end, you will probably, you, I hope that you all will achieve great results and you will have uh, your chance to, to shine. And so uh, maybe one last, last, uh, really, I promise the last thing that uh, it's a funny thing, but I think my uh, colleague from the uh, previous cycle, Natalie, would like me to, to say to you that pr please free the racks. So uh, I once again, welcome to you all to, to IMT. We now give the floor to Niraj Rathod, student from the third, third cycle from the Computer Science and Systems Engineering Curriculum. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Uh, my name is Neera Shatur. I come from India. Did my bachelor's in engineering back in India. Did master's here in Italy. And I'm currently enrolled in 33rd cycle of computer science and system engineering here at IMT. So to, to begin with, uh, being in the, the fourth year of my PhD now, I would like to start with, uh, with uh, reflecting back. Why did I join IMT? So the, the idea was to go with the research group that works on the same research interest. And I found it here with this school research group. And I joined IMT for that reason. Uh, apart from that, um, uh, what I work on is uh, controlling the walking robots with another research center here in Italy. And it has been amazing experiences uh, since I joined uh, in this research collaboration. And I hope uh, many of you will do it eventually in your PhD too. So that that's there and about uh, IMT. So little did I know about IMT before joining it. Living here has been a, a very different experience than what I expected a PhD life would be. Uh, for instance, uh, the most different thing I would say about IMT is living and working in the same place. Uh, that comes with a lot of benefits, but also some disadvantages. So just to start with, I wouldn't start to complain, but I would like to highlight them for you guys to just have a heads up. Uh, so let's say living in a the same place uh, and working, you might end up mixing your personal and private life. So please be sure that you can separate them. You will eventually learn how to do it, but uh, this is a heads up. Apart from that, uh, some of us might get feeling of living in a big brother house. So everyone knows about everyone else. Uh, some of us might feel like we are not getting privacy that we need. But on the other hand, this brings a sense of community as well. So we are always there for everyone else who needs help. 
and PhD could be a very stressful and very demanding process on its own. So time to time, we need uh, shoulders to cry on, even to talk to people and, you know, get all that off uh, your heart or your uh, mind. And that for that, IMT is fantastic. So you, you meet people every time, time to time, uh, have a chat with them, go to the coffee bars and, you know, relieve all that stress. And that is very helpful. I don't know if any other school would offer you such a setup uh, for this reason. And I, I really admire that part of IMT here. Another uh, most important topic, maybe this talk was very serious, but I uh, would like to touch upon is mental health issues for PhD students. And there has been a lot of statistics that 70 to 80 percent of PhD students around the world, uh, you know, go through a lot of stress during their PhD. Uh, so how did I tackle that problem? And I would like to share with you some uh, thoughts about it. So reward yourself on what you achieve on a daily basis than just targeting on projects and papers that you need to finish on long term. This way you will feel satisfied and happy about it. Trust me, eventually this stress will build up because of the reason that you have to do a lot of things at, at the same time and you might not get that sense of accomplishment. But you can practice uh, anything that works for you and be happy about what you've done for a day uh, that you, you've been working. Every day, do something new, learn something new that will also give you a sense of accomplishment and try not to work on weekend because in IMT, this is a thing. We work also over the weekend. Try to do something that you like and enjoy uh, your life as well. There is personal life uh, you've got, so you have to also enjoy that part that will make it uh, much more uh, enjoyable and enriching experience here at IMT. Also, you can hang out with IMT students, uh, not in these days, of course, because of the COVID, but eventually there will be parties and uh, after the COVID finishes, God knows when, but uh, for sure that. One more thing. So IMT ha brings a lot of diversification because we are from different tracks, people from, I, I didn't know much about cultural heritage, economics and, uh, brain science and everything. And here I've interacted with many people and uh, got to know this field of research, which are way much different than what I work. And that has opened my brain. So I would suggest you guys to interact, understand, ask questions about these things as well. That would mm, make life much nicer and more enriching. You will start appreciating this. This will also uh, bring the fact of uh, knowing other fields and for that matter, IMT is a very good place. Uh, being a small community and being in a small town, this uh, brings a nice opportunity. Um, apart from that, uh, administrative staff here in IMT is amazing, especially for international students. Don't worry about any bureaucracy that you face. They are there. They will always help you, and you know uh, you can enjoy all the luxury of IMT because of them. <laughs> for for, uh, for the, the comfort that they bring through their services to students is amazing. With all, I would like to wrap and welcome to the 36th cycle. All of you, congratulations, and wish you nothing but the best for your PhD program here at IMD. Thank you very much for your attention. We now invite Yara El Rasi, student from the 34 cycle from the Curriculum in Cognitive, Computational and Social Neurosciences. Hello. Hello. Thank you for the introduction. So I'm going to get right into it. As has been suggested to you, you guys are starting a PhD amidst the pandemic. And that's going to have its consequences, but that also makes my job here a little bit tough because usually speakers would be relaying information to you about the fully communal, integrated monastery life of IMT. But at this point of the pandemic, I hope it's become more normal for you to want to be away from people rather than close to them. And even if it's just a physical difference, I think it could have an impact on your work environment. Um, and so I thought if I can't use my experience to give you advice, what I'm gonna do is tell you the lobster story. So I hope you all can see now Brian, the lobster. So lobsters are quite wise and they will give us a big insight very briefly. So let's start. Uh, next. 
Sorry, I have to say I'm on the phone right now and I don't have power over the presentation. <laughs> but so lobsters, they live underwater and like us humans, they need to find themselves a home, a territory. Next. And so when lobsters are in search of a new home, they are very likely to encounter another lobster that also has his eyes on that home. And so now they have to communicate to decide who's going to get it. And this communication dance is very well documented and it goes in phases that I'm going to tell you. Next, so first phase. In the first phase, both lobsters are going to release a stream of water. And this is going to allow the exchange of chemicals that will relay information about age, sex, height, demographics. Next. And so if one lobster thinks he's in over his head, then he already withdraws and the other lobster has won the house. But if not, they move on to the next phase. Next. And so in the next phase, this is the dance of going backwards and forwards, attacking and retreating, and allowing the other lobster to also attack and retreat. But there is no physical contact. This is just a show of aggression. And so if one lobster is able to scare off the other lobster, then he's also one. Next. And the other lobster has to withdraw. But if neither lobsters scare off the other, then they move on to the third phase. Next. And the third phase is trying to flip the other lobster on their back. So here there is contact. The point is, from this point of view, the lobster is exposed. And the dominant lobster is very easily able to inflict serious damage. And so there's no point. They should just stop there. And so a lobster, if flipped on its back, will always automatically withdraw as well and lose the house. Next. But if neither lobsters can actually flip the other on their back, um, then they have to go to the fourth phase. And the fourth phase is veal combat. They have to try and rip off whatever part of the other lobster that, that they can. Um, well, at this point, the losing lobster, he's quite sad. Next. <laughs> Um, but not only is he sad, but also he's gained an enemy for life because lobsters have a very good memory. Um, in fact, lobsters can stay sad for days and days and not even want to find a new home next, but also not even want to fight against um, lobsters they've previously defeated. In fact, we know that lobsters can stay sad for such a long time that their brain will literally dissolve and they will grow a new brain a subordinate brain, more appropriate for their new stature. OK, so what is happening at a chemical level? Because this is weird. <laughs> Next. So it's pretty basic. A lobster that is high on serotonin will always be dominant. A lobster low on serotonin is subordinate. But the trick about serotonin is that it's also the chemical that allows the lobster to have a straight back and a very good posture. So the subordinate lobster will always be hunched. Critically, that plays a major role in lobsters deciding who to attack first, whose territory to try and take. And so that kind of triggers a type of loop. The subordinate lobster is hunched. He will get attacked. He will get more and more broken and more and more hunched. And he will fall in a negative loop. Next. Meanwhile, the dominant lobster, he's just becoming more elite. He's gaining reputation. He's going up his positive loop. In our society, this is very equivalent to how the rich gets richer and the poor gets poorer. So even if lobsters are 350 million years old, they're ancient. To put that in perspective, dinosaurs are 65 million years old. So they've watched them come and go. Still, the organization of lobster society and the chemicals at work have a brilliant resemblance to our social organization and our nervous system. Next. So last year was bad for the world. Unfortunately, we don't know what the next year will bring us. So the only message I wanted to leave you here with today is um, be a good lobster and keep your back straight because you want this PhD experience to be you dancing through a positive loop, not stumbling on a negative one. And that's it. Thank you. We now invite Sarah Landi, student from the Sturgis second cycle, 
from the curriculum in economics, network, and business analytics. So good morning, everyone, and a warm welcome to IMT to the new students of the 36 cycle. This is actually my fifth welcome day here in Luca at IMT. And this can account for how old I am, but also for uh, how far we've got as a school and how far I've got here in, in IMT. So uh, since all of the people before me have talked enough about how beautiful and intense and incredible and exciting is this experience, uh, uh, I wanted to share uh, something more personal related to, to what happened to me. Uh, I think the um, life at IMT and your PhD experience will be uh, the story of a transformation, both personally and professionally. And I would say that we uh, change a lot more in our, um, on our human side than on our uh, professional side. When I arrived here, I thought I was uh, about to become a macroeconomist. I also joined a summer school in Paris uh, to study macroeconomics. Uh, and now I'm about to hand in my final thesis, which is about public policy with data science, with machine learning, something that I never have studied before and I never expected to, to acquire uh, during my PhD program. So I imagine that some of you are um, are like me, like when, like I was when I started. Uh, they, they know what to study, they want to stay focused on the topic, uh, but let me say that uh, you should be open to new ideas, new experiences, new direction. Uh, the, the most important thing is that you will share your uh, uh, training career with uh, people coming from different backgrounds that can teach you how to view all topics in a different way, or they will teach you new topics that you never studied before. I've seen, as I said, this transformation happening many times. I've seen myself uh, uh, changing a lot, so I recommend you to be open uh, to these changes. I came to IMT expecting an education and I will live uh, with so much more. And I suspect and I hope that the same will be true for you. The community of friends and colleagues that you will find here is like no others. Every day I learn from my professors, from my colleagues, from my peers. I feel supported by the group of mentors that I have. When it's time for a professional presentation, for an oral exam, for a job talk, there will always be someone there for you, uh, helping with feedbacks, uh, um, fixing your presentation and so on. It's like the IMT is like the um, room of requirements uh, at the Hogwarts schools. Uh, so this community appears exactly when you need it. And when you don't, it's always there, but you know it's there. So uh, it's a place where I never felt alone, not even once. I wish I was able to tell you this personally, to look at you in your eyes, to be in Cappella Guinigi, uh, in our amazing campus, to say, look around you. I know it's, now it's not possible, but you know who are your colleagues. So look around the people look at the people sitting around you even on a laptop um, these are your friends your colleagues maybe your partners in some publications so don't hesitate to to call upon them when you need them as i said professionally and most of all personally a phd can be very intense can be really tough and can challenge you in many different ways so you will never know when you need them but you always know that they will be there and they will be the best source of your um, of your support. I can assure you that there will be times in which you will be wondering why I'm here, and it still happens to me. I think it's it's extremely natural. Um, and people uh, and your research will be the reason. Uh, will will make you understand which are the reasons why you're here. So the relationship you develop with the faculty, with the students, with the administrative staff which for my experience was uh, amazing in uh, supporting me for my visiting, uh, for uh, job fairs, uh, for whatever, for certifications, for whatever um, things I needed. They will help you build your career because uh, I hope that we go out from IMT with a PhD, but we also go out as uh, men and women wanting to shape in the, the, the future. So we all want to become the movers and the shaker of the future of our country, of uh, our 
enterprises or whatever we whatever place we are working and uh, this can only happen if we meet new people if we tap into new resources if we join the community and these benefits will follow us forever uh, i have grown tremendously at imt i eagerly await my graduation and the next chapter of my life but i also know that i will be sad uh, when i have to leave this amazing community of scholars and friends behind there is no other place uh, quite like this school and i hope you to find this to be true as well best of luck to all of you and welcome to imt We thank the students for their remarks and we now invite Professor Pietrini to give his closing address. So we were set to finish by one o'clock and uh, we have a couple of minutes, which I like to take to thank everyone, the authorities, the colleagues, the students, the administrative director who have intervened today. The reason why I keep the mask uh, is just to remind you of how important it is to always respect the safety measure that we have enacted at the school to guarantee your safety. We have two priorities for you, formation and safety. We really took all the steps, possible steps, to minimize the risk of contagion you all have uh, a single occupancy room. We acquired, uh, for the time being, uh, extra rooms uh, in uh, uh, residences uh, around the city, walking distance from the school. We put in force all the possible tools to minimize the risk of contagion. The pandemic is not over, will not be over soon, will likely not uh, be over for what we mean by be over. We'll uh, have uh, better times. Certainly, we will cope with uh, the virus, but the virus will not disappear. Those who say that the virus uh, in a matter of months will disappear are either dishonest or incompetent or both. We will live with the virus. We will eventually will have a vaccine, which will not be next month, as we hear or, 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 by, by months or by several months, but the next month we will have a vaccine. will not be by next month. There are times that cannot be compressed, but we will uh, live as we are with the risks of a pandemic and try to organize our life in, uh, around this. As a matter of fact, the pandemic is a tragedy, uh, has uh, caught uh, many lives, has cut many lives, has uh, changed our habits, but at the same time is also a moment for us to reconsider some um, life uh, strategies, some priorities, some ways of organizing our life, and not a very thing necessarily in a way which is worse than the way it used to be. For sure, here at the school we will never do anything that uh, could compromise the, uh, your, your health, your safety. To fight the virus, uh, the most important thing is to always, always observe the precautionary measures with no if or but, with no exception. Viruses do move by themselves, are actually very small particles that need a human body to be carried out, around and to reproduce and to infect other people. So we are the taxis for the virus, we are the public transportation of the virus, we are the only means that the virus has to move around. If we keep this in mind, we know automatically what we need to do to slow down the spread of contagion and to prevent the contagion. So the school is uh, giving uh, you all 
several maps uh, for uh, every time period, uh, according to what our office for the security and the officer for security and prevention, uh, working along with the working group for COVID prevention, COVID contagion prevention, have uh, uh, developed. And uh, my recommendation, my request to you all is to please be safe, please be careful, always respect the measures. Keep a face mask anytime you are not alone. Wash your hands, avoid uh, gatherings, and check your health status each time you enter at the school with the uh, facilities that uh, we have in place, the thermo scanner and the uh, application to register your health status. In this way, this will be a smooth period uh, to transit uh, during uh, these difficult times. And uh, again, uh, welcome to the school. Enjoy your stay here. And uh, we are looking forward to be able to meet with you uh, in person and to uh, discuss uh, our programs. Thank you very much and enjoy your uh, period at the school.